Okay. I'm Andy Krejci. I'm coming to you from Santa Cruz, California on the beautiful Monterey Bay. And Betty Maya, are you in Colorado or Utah right now? I'm living in Southwest Colorado outside of Durango. Southwest Colorado. Beautiful dark skies, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about light pollution. I will say that during the pandemic time, I have kind of ramped up my activity in um, becoming an advocate for dark skies, especially in my local area. And you're going to find out uh, about what that work in, involves a little bit. And, you know, hopefully you'll be inspired to um, do some of it yourself, not necessarily as an advocate for the IDA, although we'd welcome you to do that. Uh, but in your planetarium, and I'm, I'm really excited to see if you have any ideas, because all of us work, you know, significant amount of our time in a dark space. So we, we kind of have some insight into... Uh, being in a dark environment. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hear your ideas. Betty Maya is um, the Director of Engagement for the IDA. IDA has been around for, what is it, 35 years, something like that, going on 35, I think. Since and, 80, whatever that math is. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I find it interesting that it was started by two astronomers, um, and I, I go into this in some of my um, outreach presentations that I do. One was Tim Hunter, who was an amateur astronomer, who was annoyed by some new lights that were put up in Tucson, Arizona, um, near where he worked. And those were, lights were put up because of the work of David Crawford, who was a professional astronomer at the time, working at Kitt Peak National Observatory outside of Tucson. Um, but they came together and, um, you know, created this. So Betty Maya, can you give a little bit of background about, uh, you know, where IDA has gone from those humble beginnings in 30 plus years? Sure, yeah. And guess, where uh, we are now. Yeah, IDA really started with the idea to protect the night sky for astronomers. But luckily, one of the co-founders, he was also a physician and Right at that time, there was also an emerging field of science coming out about the impacts of health that artificial light at night can have for humans, um, as well as animals and the environment and energy waste. And so from its humble beginnings, IDA has really grown into the global leader of dark sky conservation across the globe. And we really do this by empowering volunteers and advocates like Andy and the amazing folks in Santa Cruz and from all over the world to empower that change in their local communities. So we have 66 chapters across the state and over 900 people on kind of our advocate mailing list who are all interested in learning about dark skies and implementing the solutions um, in their own communities. So we're really excited to see how it's grown and changed and that the momentum is just continuing more and more people are reaching out and dark skies is being connected to every basically every environmental conservation movement that exists out there and we're really excited to hopefully connect it more with the work of planetariums as well yeah so um yeah i was talking to betty Mai the other day when we were planning this and i kind of see this dark sky work as kind of a funnel where it was very narrow to begin with just talking about astronomy and preserving dark skies for astronomers but uh, the ramifications of light pollution is very, very broad topic. And um, uh, some of you probably know this already. Um, we'll be sharing some resources where you can find out more. But in, in regards to human health, uh, horrible effect on wildlife and, um, and just preserving, uh, well, yeah, effect on the appreciation of the night sky. So, um, intentionally making this interactive. So if Carrie's ready, we're going to try something new. We're going to try some um, polling. Uh, so you have something to do and we can kind of get an idea of where, where, uh, where you're coming from. So um, if Carrie can start the first poll. Yeah, so this is good news. So um, probably a lot of you know Kelly Beatty, who 
um, worked for Sky and Telescope magazine for uh, a lot of years. And um, he gave a presentation where he was talking to amateur astronomers. And he said that amateur astronomers, about only 3% of them are members of the IDA. Uh, so I'm pleased that we got 5%. And that was even without me uh, <laughs> saying it. But, um, you know, hopefully, some of you will be inspired to, uh, you know, either personally or professionally to join after this. And as Benjamin shared, it's 35 bucks a year. Maybe Benjamin's the, the one member since he knows that off the top of his head. All right, let's go to the next poll. So this is great. I'm very encouraged. How about you, Betty Maya? Ah, it looks good. No yeah, matter. So, good yeah, about half of you, you know, well, 75% basically 70% um, either often or always bring up the topic of light pollution um, during live shows in your dome. So this will make the, um, and 0% and never, that's great. Um, so yeah, you'll have an opportunity in the breakout room to kind of share um, your best tips. So um, very encouraged. Betty Maya, do you wanna talk about the concept of advocates and chapters for a moment? Yeah. Always. Um, so like I mentioned before, IDA really implements its mission through our volunteers, which we call kind of our advocate network or our dark sky network. Um, and so we have local groups in different communities and these are our chapters. We also have individual volunteers on behalf of IDA who are our delegates. Um, and these are spread all over and around the world. And these people have agreed to be local points of contact for dark sky questions, comments, concerns, activities in their area. Um, and they're the true fighters on the ground who are really making the difference and protecting the night from light pollution in their community. So we're always looking for, for more people to join, but even if you're not interested in, in being a full-blown advocate for IDA, these are great folks to reach out to for potential partnerships um, as speakers, to help with other dark sky related projects you may be interested in working on. Um, and so I think we have a poll about that. Yeah, so first question, um, there's two related ones. The first is just off the top of your head, do you know of an advocate or chapter um, in your area. And by in your area, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know, you can define it yourself. I'm thinking maybe in, within an hour or so. Um, so just off the top of your head and maybe because you are an advocate or, a, or part of a chapter, that means yes. All right, so we're getting some good responses here. I'll give you the play-by-play, -play, but let Carrie um, close the poll and share it. We're up we're about 80-20 right now. 80% uh, don't know of an advocate or chapter. Now your assignment is to go to this map. And instead of off the top of your head, uh, go to this follow, follow this link and see if you can find on the map an advocate or a chapter in your general area. And again, I'll leave that up to you to decide what uh, you think is nearby. So you can probably go ahead and put up the next survey or the next poll, which is the results of your search. So we're at about 80-20, just under general knowledge. So hopefully uh, that'll go up after some research. No, oh, too bad, Ken. Where are you, Ken? I forget. I know you're somewhere. I'm in uh, Lumberton, North Carolina, which is right along the I-95 corridor, a you know, big interstate in the Easter Coast, so, yuck, of the United States. So, um, you know, bad, bad night sky, pretty much within 20 miles in either direction of that ribbon of highway. You can actually see it at night from the, you know, the night view of Earth. You see the right. ribbon right up the East Coast. Yeah, the icons I don't think are especially important that it's the distinctions between an advocate and a chapter. Yeah, you can go ahead and put there the poll go. up. All right, so we got better. So these are, again, potential people you can call on if you don't want to do a lot of research into this. We have experts out there, or IDA has experts out there. I say we because I'm a member and an advocate. Um, Carol, unfortunately, two hours away. Well, you know. That might be a person that's motivated to uh, to visit you. Who knows? 
Well, and we'll be getting more and more as more people. That's true. So keep yeah, checking. And I don't know, there have been some problems with the map too, I, I guess. So oh, I don't yeah. know how often that's updated. Our website is like from the 1800s, but we're updating it in the new year. So now I've got another link for you. Very, very similar. I will put it in the chat. This is not about advocates. This is about a dark sky place, which um, why don't you share what a dark sky place is, uh, Betty Maya? Yeah, so we have an international dark sky places program, which recognizes five different types of places throughout the world that have really taken an initiative to protect the night. Um, applications to be become a dark sky place typically take anywhere from one to three years to complete. So they're very in depth and um, well worthy of applause when they get their designation because it's hard work. Um, so we have dark sky parks, which are places like, you know, Grand Canyon, natural bridges, kind of your typical national parks where people can go see the night sky. We have dark sky reserves, which incorporate dark sky parks and areas that round that dark sky park to be a buffer to really protect that initial core of dark sky. Um, there are dark sky sanctuaries, which are places that are so dark that they're really not actually facing a lot of threats of light pollution, and we hope that that designation will keep them that way. Um, and then some of the cooler ones are dark sky communities, and this you don't actually need to have a certain level of dark sky to become a dark sky community. So in theory, New York City or LA or Chicago could be a dark sky community. Uh, they do have to follow all lighting ordinances in both residential and city um, and municipal lighting. So it's a big feat, um, but those are really cool. And then our newest designation is an urban night sky place, which also doesn't have a minimum sky quality. Um, and we're really excited about that as a way to promote dark skies and light pollution reduction to more of an urban population as well. Our, our most recent one is 25 kilometers from the city center of Chicago. Um, and it's just a great place where people can go and experience what dark sky friendly lighting looks and feels like uh, without having to travel you know, to rural areas that have no light pollution. Great. So, Carrie, why don't we go up with the next poll? So hopefully you've been noodling around on that other map. And similar question, but um, easy di driving distance. Again, that's, um, you know, subjective. I'm thinking, you know, maybe three hours. This is like a place you could send your visitors, you know, because all these dark sky places have dark skies, but they also, as part of their um, purview, is having education programs at night. Uh, for visitors. So um, this can be a place you can point people to because I, 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 I really believe and I kind of work against this, the, the, the planetarium is a very seductive, exciting place. But I think as far as me personally, I really want to get people excited about experiencing the real night sky, not uh, a digital or analog version of the night sky, the real thing. So um, I think this is a wonderful follow-up um, to the planetarium experience, sending people where they can see a dark sky, relatively so, um, maybe look through some telescopes, go to a program, and also part of that education of a dark sky place is to inform people about what they can do at home um, to choose better lighting fixtures. So we got about 50-50 here, looks like. So you can, you can probably end this one now. Oh, great, dark sky place for the 2019 solar eclipse. So yeah, actually, Betty, do you wanna talk about the work you've done in the past, um, you know, before working with IDA, um, getting some of these dark sky parks going uh, where you were living? Yeah, it's super fun. If you don't have a dark sky place near you, it's a great way to engage with the dark sky community and have kind of some tangible goals to work towards. Um, I got to work for Utah State Parks and we started actually 12 different dark sky park applications across the state of Utah, which was a, a large undertaking, um, but it's super fun. Uh, you go out there, you count all the lights, um, you know, you make a lighting inventory of all the lights, the type of light, if it's shielded, whether it's, you know, on or off at night, what its use is. 
Um, you get to go out with the unihedron sky quality meter and point it up at the sky and get a reading back of how dark your sky is. Um, and then all of these places also, as Andy mentioned, need to have regular public outreach events. So hosting star parties or partnering with the planetarium, right? And doing these things to bring the community in and promote dark skies through kind of experiential learning and place-based having fun. Um, so yeah, that's also a great way to get involved with IDA is to reach out if there's a local park nearby that you think has dark skies, or if you're in an urban area, if there's a park within the city that may be interested in working on retrofitting their lighting and, and hosting these nighttime events. Um, it's a really fun and engaging way to actually make a, make a difference in the field. Yeah, and that's something I'm working on right now. I'm working with Pinnacles National Park, which is about an hour and a half from where I live. And they're very motivated to do this. And so um, I'm working closely with them. So um, stay tuned for um, that becoming a, a dark sky park in the in the couple of years, but probably it's a, it's a fairly involved process, which I'm fi finding out. Um, and I've had some talks with our city about doing an urban uh, dark sky place within the city that is, you know, naturally dark. And we've done a, a test um, star party there. One question yeah. from Jeff that you might want to address now. Has uh, IDA worked with NASA's Night Sky Network? Yeah, we, we actually have worked with them. Um, Vivian is part of our planning committee for our um, global conference, which is actually coming up in November, which all of you should definitely join since you love virtual conferences so much. <laughs> this is um, Vivian from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Yes. Yeah, yeah. she's awesome. Yeah, she's really cool. Um, and so, yeah, we could probably do a lot better of like integrating our work with, with them, but we do have some connection. I think it's Vivian, Vivian Lee. Vivian White, isn't it? Vivian, Vivian White. Vivian White. Yeah. Vivian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so I've popped uh, another link in the chat that is a list of resources. Pretty much they're all <laughs> they're all accessible from the IDA website. So you can use this as a guideline. Um, I'll just, you know, feel free to just kind of um, cruise around and check it out while I'm speaking. But um, going down the list, the IDA website is just a phenomenal resource. Uh, but a couple of things, there's a, a six minute uh, video uh, produced by Loch Ness Productions that's available for free in full dome. Um, it's a little outdated now because it doesn't deal with LED technology, which has kind of changed, changed things. But it's a, it's a, it's, it introduces, introduces um, your audiences to, you know, the basic concepts and, uh, and the price is right. Um, the, there's glossary, public outreach materials. Uh, those are only available to IDA members. Uh, but if you are a member, you can get as many brochures as you want. We distribute them liberally at our outreach events. And this could be something you could have just have on hand in your lobby if you um, want that. If you are a little bit more nerdy, there's a database of scientific studies a uh, great site with an interactive light pollution map that you can really kind of lose yourself into um, looking into um, satellite data. Uh, then there's that globe at night, which um, some of you probably, I'm sure a lot of you probably heard of, which is a citizen science campaign measuring uh, light pollution. Um, and yeah, if you have an hour or so in the car, uh, at the bottom there, uh, Starving for Darkness podcast. And I think Betty Maya is going to be on the next one. Is that true? Yep. <laughs> Did you record that already? Yeah. Awesome. How'd it go? It was fun. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I was on one. There's like 20, 20 some now. And those are, are uh, sponsored and hosted by two people in the lighting uh, community. And that's, that's key in this is uh, changing what's available out there. Um, uh, to use. All right. Well, now it's uh, we're getting to be your time to shine. Oh, I just wanted to show off our uh, our chapter logo. Um, you know, we were talking about working with indigenous people yesterday in the in the um, presentation I was involved with, and you know, working with people locally. 
And, you know, there's an old saying, um, all politics is local. Uh, so we have this local um, group and we made a, a logo, which I really like with, with these uh, sea stars, which we, you can find on our beach, reflecting the stars in the night sky. Here's um, something I'm working on with our city. These are these horrible acorn lights on bridges that they're, they're called street lights, but they, they put glare out into driver's eyes, which is really annoying and in fact dangerous. And then they light up the river. That river has uh, two endangered species that are um, not in good shape right now. Coho salmon historically have run the San Lorenzo River as have uh, steelhead trout and they're monitoring them and light at night shining into rivers has been proven to be harmful to uh, juvenile salmonids. They're attracted to it when they're young and that makes them prone to predation. So um, we've actually gotten NOAA involved in this. And so hopefully these lights will be remediated, but it's a, it's a big problem for uh, numerous species. Those are just uh, two of the ones we're working on locally. And these are these five, um, five principles that I think are really, really handy. Um, there's a, a link to this in uh, the resource page. Uh, one thing we've done here is um, instead of doing PowerPoint presentations, meeting people uh, at night, and just introducing to them to these principles and having them evaluate lighting on their own according to whether it's useful, targeted, has appropriately low light levels, uh, whether it's controlled and whether it's the proper color temperature. So, um, you know, humans have evolved with uh, firelight at night and that's what we're looking for. It's kind of a warmer, warmer color. The bluer light is um, much more harmful for us at night uh, in terms of disrupting our circadian rhythm. All right, so we're gonna send you off into breakout rooms. So um, here's you know, two things you can do in here for eight minutes. You can um, share existing techniques or practices. I know I've read some on Dome Dialogues, very creative. Um, and you know, decide which one of those to share. You'll have a, you know, a minute or so to share. Um, what you've discussed and what you think might work. Uh, or optionally, if you want, if you're feeling creative this late at night <laughs> or in the afternoon, um, collaborate on a, an idea that maybe revises one of those techniques or practices and in creating an interactive light pollution activity. So these are always fun to do at in-person concerts. So uh, Carrie, if you could um, divide people up, there's gonna be probably three or four people per room and you'll have eight minutes and then about a minute to just kind of share what you talked about and uh, what your ideas are. Yeah, so the idea is just to have some representative from each breakout room um, share your ideas. Um, we talked about our audience reactions to bringing down the lights and how you can tell the city kids from the country kids. Uh, we wondered about the merits of talking about a blackout as opposed to a place away from city lights because there are instances where people have suddenly seen the sky from the city because all the lights went out. Okay. Um, we talked about hands-on activities where you retrofit a light um, that shines in all directions to make it a light that shines where it ought to shine using simple materials which we've done in our planetarium, and it was reported that they had done it at Ellipse uh, gathering. I'll just quickly add, because it links to your invitation for us to become more aware of where dark sky sites are near to us, that it's, and the idea of instirring people to actually make venture to those places. And so I think it's really valuable to locate, you know, this is like what it is and where we are, and here's where you could go to make it look like this and to try to do that fairly accurately. And I think the dark sky uh, advocates could probably assist us with that, you know, in regards to making that realistic. Thank you for that. So how about group number two? Yeah, so we basically just talked about some of the stuff that we do in 
in our shows, um, starting with light pollution, bringing it down just to give people that sort of wow factor to realize what they can see outside of it. Um, you know, when you leave the lived in areas, um, using cell phones as a way to generate light pollution inside of the dome. Um, Mm -hmm. and then also talked a little bit about, um, dark sky areas and, and lighting, um, the decisions that we make and how cities make with their lighting and how big of an effect that has. Um, I was explaining, I live pretty close to, um, the, uh, the urban night sky area that Betty Maya was talking about. It's uh, Palos park, which is not too far away from our dome here and how it is close to Chicago. There is still light pollution there. It's not, you know, incredibly dark, but they are doing the work to help make it darker. And that is the important part. They are, you know, making conscious decisions about lighting, doing educational stuff. Um, and so doing stuff like that, especially in our domes can, can really help spread everything. Thank you. So how about, oh, group number three. Yeah. So, um, I had, we talked about wanting to, uh, well, I guess I'm showing a little bit of it. I'll show myself, uh, maybe, to use the dome and the fact that we can simulate in the dome to adjust the brightness of the stars in the dome based on light pollution levels. And so to show maybe if you're in a light polluted area, what it would look like without the light pollution or vice versa. April, you got to share your activity. Okay, it's um, an outreach program I do for third graders. Their pollution is part of that strand in science. And it's, uh, it's essentially a review of different kinds of pollution. They all know water and land and air pollution. They don't know, they don't think about sound pollution and they sure don't think about light pollution. So their activity is they have a box full of stuff from the recycling bin and pieces of aluminum foil and, you know, two paper clips and a string. They have to create a full cutoff fixture using um, those really bright mag lights that you can take the top off and it makes itself into a little tiny street light. Um, there's a book called There Once Was a Sky Full of Stars that essentially those pictures can match up with a mag light and you can use it to show starting off in the classroom with everybody has their street lights on, you look up at the ceiling, oh, it's, you can't see anything, it's all light. And then at the end of the lesson, they have their fixtures in place and then we turn the lights off again and see if you can actually see a dark ceiling now. So, and the, <laughs> the kids just love it. The the, pro, the the challenge right now is sterilizing or getting the stuff clean in between groups because everything has to be wiped down from COVID and all that. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge right now, but we'll see how it works. It's been real successful in the past. So I think uh, number four. I think a lot of the things that we talked about have been mentioned by other groups unless there's we did cell phones, reactions from kids in the city and in the, not in the city, in the countryside, unless there's something I'm forgetting. Well, well why, do you talk, why don't you talk about the cell phones yep. and exactly what, what you do with them, in case some people don't know. Sure, go ahead, Carol, you were the one who talked about Yes, um, I have the adults uh, normally uh, turn on their cell phones and and shine them up and uh, there's a starry sky and uh, usually someone, at least one person has flashlight mode and so they make it very, very bright. And then I say, okay, now turn your cell phones off and see what a difference it makes and now keep your cell phones off, put them away. Yeah, and I think uh, another thing, Carol, that you touched on uh, and I haven't got a chance to, to talk about, the, the connection with our ancestors, how our ancestors were able to see the stars didn't have that, that same light pollution. Um, and certainly in Scotland, when I'm talking about the kids, we have some wonderful uh, standing stones at Calnish and uh, in the Outer Hebrides and, and up at, uh, in Orkney and places like that. So I have uh, some footage I show in the planetarium of, of those sites. And, and try and connect the audience back to uh, to their ancient ancestors when there was no light pollution. Yeah, I I turn off the light of the moon and we see the Milky Way and, and all of that. And I say, this is what many people saw long ago before electricity. And this is what you have been robbed of. Please. Brianna raised her hand. 
Thanks. Um, I just wanted to add on to um, Carol's comment. One of the ways that we've done um, with cell phones is to have them turn them up in the same way, but then you just simply have them turn them still with the screen on, turn them down, and that has a dramatic difference to show you, you know, even just downward facing light can make a big difference. So wonderful idea. I never thought of that. Okay, next group. I think we spent most of our time talking about um, the lighting on college campuses and how you could get students interested in actually analyzing, you know, is the light doing what it's supposed to? Is it shining where you need it? Is it shining places you don't need it? Kind of like that bridge with the lights that blind everybody trying to cross the bridge, you know, just to, to get students involved and kind of make a fun project out of it. Yeah, and if, if you have the bandwidth to talk to the facilities people um, on your campus, you know, that's another, another route you can go. Yeah, they're pretty good where I work, actually. They've, um, we had an observing area and they actually put kind of a lampshade on one of the uh, street lights because there was a college street that is there. And now we're going to have to negotiate about like what to do with our new bright LED street lights. Yeah. Um, but they're pretty good about it, luckily. So group six. Yeah, we were talking about mainly using phones and flashlights to um, show audiences the light pollution inside the dome. Um, an idea was brought up from Terry that we could use cove lights specifically of different colors to show how colors relate to how we perceive light, like the stars in the sky, with a red cove versus a blue cove versus the white light cove, which I thought was really cool. And that is something I will definitely be using in the future. Um, and then I also specifically talked about how I am not in a planetarium right now. I am in science on a sphere. And hopefully we'll be back in the dome here within the next year or two. But with science on a sphere, we have a large um, window, which doesn't really help with our projections on our sphere. But I like to lead the audience around the room to see the different sides of the sphere and how the windows and the light coming from the windows really diminishes the projections and mutes the, the colors and, and the brightness of those um, projections. And we lead them around to the opposite side. And the picture is much brighter, much clearer. And that, that's specifically what I do outside of the dome. That brings us to room seven. I mean, I'll just say great minds think alike, but I'm, I was personally curious about what people's number was in terms of dimming your stars to simulate your own light pollution, because in Los Angeles, I have to go all the way down to like 15%, uh, 15 to 20% just to, just to get it somewhat similar to what uh, LA people are, are used to. And Tony was like 50%. And I was like, wow, 50%. That's not bad. Where is Tony? It was a guess, but I'm in Honolulu. <clears throat> it was a guess. We just have a slider, so I don't usually pay attention. I'm not usually looking at my hand. I'm just like, you know, kind of sliding. But it's not as low as 15% was, you know. But, you know, it's not terrible. We do ours by apparent magnitude, and I would, I would guess it's right around four and a half, four and a half or five in the Seattle area, where we're in Bremerton, which is a smaller city. Well, thanks for all your uh, contributions. Yeah, so that full dome video is on the um, on the resource page that I shared with you all. So, you know, have at it. Um, do you have any um, final comments, Betty Maya? Yes, I do. Um, Please. Well, thanks everyone for listening and sharing all your ideas. I'm actually very inspired um, by all of your passion and creativity. So it was really nice to meet you all. Um, I'm just going to pop a link in the chat to a Google form. Um, this is to join the Advocate Network if you're interested in kind of um, just being a part of IDA's network. This isn't necessarily identifying yourself as a point of contact yet, but this just brings you in to the fold. Um, we use Slack as a way to connect dark sky advocates from all around the world. Um, it's a great place to share resources, to ask questions, to make dark sky friends, really. That's our goal is to kind of help people find each other in this 
feel that can be lonely. We feel like we're the only people who care about this issue. Um, so our goal is to really create a sense of community around dark sky conservation. So we'd love to have you join. We also have monthly meetings on different dark sky topics every month. Um, and they're usually pretty interesting and fun. And they're like this, where you can see everyone's faces and also like this, where we have people calling in from around the world. So it's cool to hear and see others' perspectives. Um, and then we have a monthly newsletter with kind of some insider dark sky info that we send out. So if you're interested in joining, uh, you don't have to do anything except for fill out that form. Um, and then we will send you more information. Yeah, and I, I believe that I linked that form on the resource page as oh, well. Great. Thanks, but, Yeah, use Betty Maya's link and sign up, sign up right now. Did you all, there's been a lot of activity in the chat. Did you already include a link to join as a member since we only have one? You can find that on the IDA page very okay. easily. All yeah. right. That's a good call. So <laughs> I'm just going to share one thing to kind of wrap up. And then we'll probably have um, a few minutes to um, have last questions if, um, if there are any. Well, Andy, I was curious if um, you had any success stories that IDA wants to share about communities that have kind of gotten their light pollution under, under control that we can kind of hold up to people to, to say, hey, this works. Yeah, so on that map there, are, or on the page of Dark Sky Places, there are, you know, actual cities or communities that have, um, you know, really changed the lighting for the whole community. So I, I would I would send you there, um, and again you could connect with those people through the advocate network. Yeah, um, Jeff, I would say probably the first uh, thing that comes to mind is just Tucson, which is the home place of the IDA, um, who recently did an LED lighting transition um, and reduced. I am not going to say these numbers right, but reduced the amount of sky glow by like maybe 30%, I'm just gonna, I'm looking for the article right now. Um, but that was an example of a lighting retrofit that was actually done well and LEDs that's done well, which, you know, we don't typically see a ton of. Um, and I found this article, so I'm gonna pop it in the chat. Um, and then another one that I think is really cool as well is um, Mont Megantic in Quebec it was a dark sky reserve and they, um, Mont Megantic is an observatory and they worked on a dark sky reserve application for all around their observatory. And they brought in the National Park Service um, Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division with their you know, panoramic CCD cameras to do modeling of before and after. They did lots of community outreach to have lighting changed in multiple different communities around the observatory and were able to measure a large reduction in light pollution with those like very technical instruments as well. So. Those are a couple examples that come to mind for like positive success stories. And then one thing that I really like to do is I like to tell stories from different perspectives. Are there any actual like say economic studies based on how much money these cities save? Yeah, yeah we have, there's one peer reviewed economic study from the University of Missouri that looked at astrotourism along the Colorado plateau over a 10 year period. Um, and it found that dark skies over 10 years, dark sky tourism brings $2.5 billion to local economies and over 50,000 jobs. Um, and the main like reason for that is to experience a night sky program, people actually have to spend the night in an area and that increases your spending. It's about fourfold um, is what the study found. So I can also, I think I have a link to the full article, which I think might be behind a paywall if you just look it up. But I think if you just Google like economics of dark sky tourism, Colorado Plateau, it, it should come up. I mean, that sounds amazing. I meant, I specifically meant things like how much electricity cities are saving from. Oh, um, well, the, the big issue is with LEDs, you know, they're so much more economical as far as, far as they, they put out a lot more light for a lot less money. The unfortunate thing that's happened is, and I, I call this light privilege, um, it's so much cheaper to have more light and we're these you know, diurnal creatures that are in love with light. We just put up more light because, oh, hey, I can put twice as much light you know, with the thinking, oh, I'm twice as safe or what have you and, um, you know, and still be saving money. 
So um, ideally, if you're using you know proper fixtures, you can you can um, you know save a lot more. But unfortunately, that the reality is a little bit different. Yeah, we do have like an old study that shows that like wasted light, which you know is light that's pointing directly up. Um, wastes about 15 million tons of carbon dioxide each year. And that is just for the US. Um, and then that translates for, to $3 billion um, per year. And I've heard the estimates range from three to 7 billion. No, that's it. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's key to, to you know, we're not going to get rid of all light pollution in cities but we can do a lot better. So it's great having these dark sky parks. I, I come up with a slide for some of my presentations where I show Martha, who was the last passenger pigeon in the Cincinnati Zoo that lived into the you know, early 20th century. And you know it's all well and good if we have these dark sky places to go to where you have to drive um, a ways, but uh, I think the goal should be much, much broader than that. And, you know, and, you know, actually one of the most recent um, advocate, monthly advocate meetings was about um, urban light pollution and, and doing something about it in cities. And, you know, you talk about um, economics, the most economically disadvantaged people are usually the ones that are exposed to the more light, most light pollution, which is um, another thing to work on. That's a great point, Andy. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, these these great places like um, Borrego Springs, you know, it's people with a lot of money that can afford it, have beautiful lights and nice dark skies. But, um, you know, the sky should be everyone's. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I was going to wrap up with a, a little poem here, unless we have, do we have another question that just popped up? Pardon me? Sorry, I'm just saying there's, there's lots of amazing dark sky projects in Scotland. Um, I was just posting a couple of things in the chat there. Oh, great. Yeah, so I'd like to follow interrupt up to you about those. Yeah, yeah, cool. Anyway, yeah, in one of my presentations, I, I go through history and talk about people who have recognized uh, an appreciation for darkness in times past. Um, and one of them was this uh, Japanese author. And, and since we had the um, Japanese related uh, presentation yesterday, I thought I'd, I'd share this. This is Junichiro Tanizaki who was a, a novelist in um, Japan. But in the 1930s, he published this uh, essay. It's a very thin, slender um, book that you can read easily in one evening. And uh, I think it's sublime, um, personally. Um, so he was bemoaning the loss of Japanese culture to, uh, uh, you know, in, in the 30s and talking specifically about what light has, had done because culturally um, Japan was kind of more appreciation of you know, light and dark and the, the play of light and shadow and all that sort of thing. And he talks about you know, the shoji screens and about how traditional uh, Japanese houses would have much less light in the center. It would just, just be a little bit of light uh, reaching the center. And um, this past spring, I worked with uh, middle school students um, in a poetry thing and learned how to do blackout poetry where you just kind of black out some of the lines. So um, hopefully this is worthy of um, eighth grade level, but um, uh, I've got two little short poems based on blacking out some of the other words on the other, uh, the rest of the pages. So uh, one of them is, you have seen a distant glimmer, an ethereal glow, like the horizon at sunset, exquisitely beautiful. And the other one, made to be seen in the dark, the gold harmonizes with the wrinkled skin and the flickering light. So in that second one, he's talking about a lacquer bowl and how gold, he talks about this throughout the book, how gold in, you know, um, traditional no theater costumes was meant to be seen in dim light and under artificial light, it's downright gaudy. So um, kind of, you know, sharpening your senses and, you know, opening your yourself to a different sort of experience, which isn't possible, um, you know, under the bright, bright glare of artificial light. Excellent. Anyway, Carrie's probably tired. I don't know how long. <laughs> 
we've gone kind of late, but uh, I appreciate all of your contributions and uh, both to this session and what you're doing in your planetariums because um, yeah, we're a key place to get the word out.